Good morning. Uh, good to be able to talk with you this morning. Uh, getting a little bit excited because uh, we're beginning to hear in the news that uh, we might be actually uh, seeing a, a, an end to the uh, quarantine that we have been placed under. And I still don't know any particular date that that's going to be uh, declared, but it does appear that uh, things are uh, in the preparation for it. So we're excited about the possibility of being able to come back together, perhaps not in the too distant future. Your session and I are going to be meeting soon, and we're going to talk about the time in which we are able to come back together once the uh, uh, the governor uh, makes the decision, and we'll uh, be in compliance with that as we have been with the, the quarantine. Uh, and we are looking forward to a time of celebration, uh, especially with that first Sunday. Uh, we may have a chance to share uh, with one another some of the stories uh, where God has been working in our lives during this time and uh, how he has uh, been there uh, for us as a strength and how he's allowed us to serve him by being a strength and encouragement to others as well. So uh, looking forward to all of this, uh, but in the meantime, we have at least one more message, this message in which I will be sharing with you by, by way of video. Uh, first of all, a couple of announcements, uh, some good news. Uh, congratulations to the Urquizas. Uh, they have a little girl, Lydia Naomi uh, Urquiza, seven pounds, three ounces. Uh, last word I had, both mom and baby were doing very well. Uh, we uh, rejoice with them uh, in the coming of this child and addition to their family. Also, Jennifer Weldon uh, got some good news on uh, her recent biopsy, and uh, it's looking good for her. Uh, and if there are any uh, follow-ups, any treatments, uh, all of this is uh, just something that can wait till after the uh, coronavirus uh, deal is passed, and uh, she can get her treatments at that particular time. But but the diagnosis looks very good, and we rejoice again for, for Jennifer and, and Mark in this situation. I uh, want to thank you for your faithfulness uh, in terms of serving our Lord in, in various ways in which you have. I've heard some of your stories, and I'm very touched by them and, and grateful uh, for your willingness to serve God and to serve one another in the manners in which you were uh, made able to do so. Uh, your giving uh, has been pretty good. Uh, it's not exactly where we would like for it to be uh, as a whole, but uh, the giving for March was about $2,000 short of what we had budgeted. Uh, but the good news is that we, uh, having been in shutdown, uh, for the most part, have spent a, a lot less than we uh, had, uh, determined we would be spending. So so everything pretty well, uh, you know, Cut was covered in, the, in light of that. Uh, but as we gear up to get back together and, and things become more active, obviously uh, the uh, expenditures will become more as well. So please uh, think about that, pray about it, and uh, let us be faithful as we uh, uh, in our coming back together as we have been in the time we've been apart so that we can meet the challenges that are before us. Uh, I'm going to be sharing with you today from uh, First Kings. Uh, out of the 19th chapter. So if you want to go ahead and get your Bibles, you can turn there. First Kings chapter 19. I'm going to begin reading uh, with verse 1 in just a moment. Uh, last uh, time I preached to you, I shared you a message about uh, the coronavirus or a storm called the coronavirus. Well, I want to follow up this Sunday with a message, the school called coronavirus. Uh, because uh, there's a, been a time in which we have not only been tested, but uh, and the idea of being tested uh, brings school back to my memory. Uh, so we, we have also been in school, if you will, and hopefully we have learned things as a result of this time of schooling. Uh, let me take you now to uh, 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse 1, and we begin reading God's word together. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything that Elijah had done and how that he had killed all the prophets with a sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me and be it ever so severely if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. Now Elijah was afraid, so he ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba and Judah, 
he left his servant there while he himself went on for another day's journey into the desert. He came to a broom tree and he sat down under it and he prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life for I am no better than my ancestors. And then he lay down under the tree and he fell asleep. All at once, an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around and there by his head was a cake of bread already baked over hot coals and there was a jar of water. He ate and he drank and then he lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, get up and eat for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and he ate and he drank. Strengthened by the food, he traveled 40 more days and nights until he had reached Horeb, the mountain of God. And there he went into a cave and he spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? And he replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant. They have broken down your altars and put your prophets to death by the sword. And I am the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. And then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face, and he went out and he stood at the mouth of the cave. Then the voice said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? That is the word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. Father, I pray that you will help me to be able to fully discern and, and, and bring forth the message that is within this message. Uh, not only the message you delivered to Elijah, your prophet, long ago, but the message you now wish to deliver to your people here today. I pray for those not only of our church family, but any who have joined us in this time of, uh, of hearing your word today, that they too will hear you speak to their hearts as they need to hear you. Make our hearts, Lord, soft for you. Uh, help us to be ready, not only to hear and, and to understand with our minds, but to fully appreciate and, and to take hold of and let it take hold of us, your word, as far as our hearts are concerned too. So that it's not something that we just know when we leave here, but it's something that we also are agreeing with and we will agree with it by our actions, living according to your words as you desire us to do so. Give me now the strength to be able to share this message in the way that you wish. And I give you the glory and the praise as always through Jesus Christ, our Lord, for it's in his name I pray. Amen. We've been hearing, as I mentioned a few moments ago, some good news in, in light of the, the coronavirus. Uh, they are telling us that we uh, are seeing a leveling off and maybe even a, a, a downward turn uh, as far as uh, the, the cases of the coronavirus. Uh, they're talking about uh, beginning to move back toward normalcy, if you will, uh, and to get things started up again in our, in our country. Uh, but I noticed a time or two different people saying this, that uh, the, the normalcy will not be the same normal that we had before the coronavirus. It's going to be a new normal. Uh, and, and that things aren't going to be like they once were. Now, that can be a, 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 a bad thing, I guess, but it can also be a good thing. And, and I believe whenever we as God's people go through an experience, that he means for things to be different when we come through it. And, uh, but he doesn't mean for it to be worse than it was. As his children, he wants us to be better for having gone through it. He wants us to have learned something, if you will, along the way. And so that our lives are more enriched because of it. And our God is not one who desires to beat down his children, but rather to build them up, 
the enemy would like to beat us down. And if the enemy has his way, he will have used the experience of this and all to, to make us feel defeated, to make us feel like we have lost far more than, than we could have possibly have hoped to gain through all of this. But we don't listen to him. We listen to what God has to say. And now you and I are going to be coming out, if you will, the light at the end of the tunnel is beginning to reveal itself. What are we going to be, though, when we come out of this tunnel? How, how will we be different? And, and uh, will we have, what will we have learned through the experience of the, of the coronavirus? And, uh, what, and how will we apply what we have learned to our lives? Well, there's a few things that I take from the passage that I just read to you a few moments ago. Uh, about the, 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 the school of coronavirus, things that hopefully we have learned. I know we could have learned and, and, and should have learned, and hopefully we have learned these things. And, and, and there are things that we can still build upon and, and, and further learn from, and hopefully our, uh, our lives will be more enriched for it. Uh, but one of the things that I hope you have learned as you've gone through the school of coronavirus is this, that Quiet time with God is a necessity. And that's the first thing I want you to notice here and, and to jot down if you're going to take notes along the way, that quiet time with God is a necessity. And uh, we, we need this time alone with God. Now, we have been really busy before the, the coronavirus came along. We, we, we were all caught up in, in our, our living, our rushing around here and there, uh, but we've had an opportunity and perhaps not by choice, but 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 we were forced to, to, to be still. I hope you didn't let that go to waste. I hope you found the opportunity to make more time in your life to be alone with God and, and to sit before the Lord and, uh, and with the, your Bible in hand or just to sit there and to think and to talk to him or to listen to him as he speak, would speak to your heart as well. We live in a society that seems to cherish noise. Have you ever noticed that people that want to drown out the noise around them, what they do? A lot of times they'll stick these little plugs in their ears and they'll turn on music or whatever, and they use one noise to drown out another noise. And uh, we, we, we've forgotten how to be quiet. And, and in fact, we, we think of quiet as, as being something that is, that is really negative when, it, when it's, it's really something that we should think of more as a, a positive. And I'll to be able to, to sit down away from the, the noise, away from uh, the things that have been so distracting in our lives so that we can focus more so upon, upon our God and, and to hear what he might have to say to our life. There's a passage of scripture I wanna, want you to turn to. And, and while you're turning there, I'm going to tell you about a, a man. Uh, the scripture is in Mark chapter 1, and I'll, I'll get to it in a few moments, verses 35 through 39, if you want to go ahead and, and hold your place there. There was a, a great theologian, a, a great minister by the name of Andrew uh, Boner. Uh, and Andrew Boner, was a, he, was a, uh, he was a Scottish minister at, way back in, into the 19th century. Uh, he lived his whole life during that time, died before the turn of the century, uh, but a great man of God. He was a great man of prayer, they say as well. He had three rules that he lived by, and, and I want you to think about this. He's, first of all, he would not speak to any person until, first of all, he had spoken with Jesus in the morning. And now it was important to him that the first one he spoke to before he started his day was the Lord before he spoke to anybody else. Number two, not to do anything with his hands until he had been on his knees. And uh, before he started working, before he started doing, he felt it important to be down on his knees in prayer. And thirdly, not to read the papers until, first of all, he had read his Bible. I, I don't know what your rule is as far as uh, each day goes, but it's pretty good rule here. And uh, these three things that he did, uh, not to speak to anyone. So first of all, he had spoken to Jesus and not to do anything with his hands until he first of all had been on his knees and not to read the papers until he had read something in his Bible. Now, having said that, I want you to look with me now in Mark's gospel in chapter one. For in Mark's gospel chapter one, we read about our, an incident in our Lord Jesus' life. It also pertained to his disciples as well. 
But I want you to note the difference here between our Lord in this particular occasion and his disciples. Jesus had been uh, uh, doing a, a great work already in this first chapter of Mark. It talks about Jesus healing many people, driving out evil spirits, and preaching, if you will, the, uh, the word of God to the peoples. He had been very, very busy. Uh, that evening at sunset, and you know, when others were going to bed, he took time to uh, to spend uh, uh, that those moments with his Father in heaven. And then it tells us, as we pick it up here in verse 35, very early in the morning, the next day, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, he left the house, and he went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Now, Simon, that is Simon Peter, and his companions, the other disciples, went to look for him. And when they found him, they exclaimed, everyone is already here looking for you. But Jesus replied, let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so that I can preach there also, for that is why I have come. So they traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. Now, I want you to think about what you just read here. And I, it's, I, when I read this uh, some time ago, it, I just sort of read through it. But I spent a little more time thinking about this. See, Jesus saw a need for spiritual renewal. And to him, in many cases, that was even more important than physical rest itself, which is not unimportant. And all, but at this time, and all, rather than spending the time uh, for additional relaxation, and all, he spent the time in prayer for revitalization. And I, I think it's good that we get rest for our bodies, but I think that many times while we're getting rest for our bodies, more so than we probably even need, and all, we're letting our spirits grow weary for unrest because we're not resting in our God by spending time with him in prayer and in study of his word. Jesus knew what was uh, ahead of him. And if he was going to be prepared to meet those challenges, if he was going to be prepared to meet the people that were still at hand that he needed to meet, he needed to meet with his father, first of all. And I want you to understand how important it is. Before you meet with anyone else, the time you spend with God is vital to building up your spirit and also helping you to be more capable of, of being able to be the witness you're supposed to be to accomplish it, what, what it is that God has in his heart for you to accomplish. I, I think it's interesting that when the disciples went looking for Jesus and uh, they found him and, uh, in this time of prayer, and, and it appears Simon Peter even more so perhaps than the others, and uh, he had already had in his mind what Jesus needed to do that day. He already, the plans were already going through through his thoughts. And he, he told them, he said, he said, Lord, and, and he was interrupting him while he was praying. Think about that. He, he broke into his prayer time and said to him, said, Lord, you know, people are already gathering. It's time to get back to work. It's time to get back out there to those people and do what you need to do. Peter, I believe, made the same mistake that you and I can make. And often perhaps we do if we're not careful. And all he already, he wanted to plan for God, what God should do and, and, and what God should do with him and with him and through him for that day. And all, rather than letting God tell him what it was that he needed to do, he was he was there to, to try to tell God what God needed to do. And, and I think too many times we plan out our lives without taking the time to talk with the Lord or to hear from God. We plan it out, whatever our day is going to be, and then we hope God will come along and that he'll bless it and he'll make something you know, good come of it. You know, we need to go to God first. We need that quiet time, that time before the Lord, and you know, to listen to him, to share our hearts for sure, but to listen to him as well, to whatever it is that he has to say. There are so many priorities in life. You know it as I know it. There are a lot of things that are demanded of us. So many priorities. And I want you to understand our Heavenly Father is the only one who can adequately arrange these priorities in the manner that they should be. So let us uh, learn that lesson. Hopefully we've had more time to think about it. We've had more time, hopefully, to, to begin practicing it. But it's something that we will continue to practice and, and, and do it even the more. Uh, it, it's never wasted the time you spend alone with God. It, it enhances the rest of your time and you know, when you're amongst others. 
you'll be more alert to God's leading and you'll be more uh, uh, able to meet the challenges, to, to be ready for the opportunities that God will give you. So I hope you will think about that. Remember what God what God did with uh, Elijah. Elijah had just been with a lot of people, and and he was all worn out with it all, and, and he was ready to to his uh, to just give it up. He had already made up his mind what was going to happen next. Nothing. He was going to quit. He was going to go on and, and and just and just go off somewhere and until he died. And now listen to what God said again to him in First uh, uh, Kings chapter nineteen. He said, "Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord." And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And then after all of this, a still, small voice. You know, you and I, you know, we, 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 you know, we get caught up in the noise. We get caught up, and 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 we think that uh, for something to happen, it it has to be dramatic. It has to be something that is just uh, totally overwhelming in that way. Uh, but often, God speaks in a still small voice. We're going to be busy again. Don't get distracted by uh, by the earthquakes, if you will, or or by the the, the mountains, uh, you know, tumbling, or 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 even by uh, the fires or whatever that are going. Don't get, don't let the the things like that distract you so much. Get along with God so that you can be still and listen, and He'll speak to your heart in ways that you perhaps haven't heard Him speak, or at least not in a while. And you need to hear him speak again. So that's one thing, one lesson we can learn, and all about the, the the quiet time with our Lord is is a necessity. The second thing is, I hope we have learned along the way, and that is to quench not the spirit. To quench not the spirit. Let write this down. First Thessalonians chapter five and verse uh, verses sixteen through nineteen. First Thessalonians chapter five. Verses 16 through 19, it reads this way. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And then it says, do not quench the spirit. Now, I want to give you a, a, a 2020 translation, a, a, a modern, if you will, translation, where it says, rejoice always. I think he's saying to us, let us find some joy in the new season, right where we are. Not, 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 not even waiting for and anticipating that we will be coming out of this tunnel, but, but even while we've been in the tunnel and in the darkness and the difficulties, and I'll find something in this season uh, to, to rejoice about. And I'll look for the good rather than focusing so much upon the bad. Look for the good. And I'll, secondly, he said, and uh, pray without ceasing. And, and, I, and I think he's reminding us that we should never disconnect with God. Never disconnect with him. Always talk to him. Give him your fears and your anxieties. Give him your hopes and your dreams. God wants everything about you. He's interested in every area of your life. And he wants to be a, a, an impact and influence in, that, in those areas. And then it says in the... In everything, we have to give thanks for this is the will of God in Jesus Christ. We, we should live our life with a grateful attitude, giving thanks to God in advance and all that, because we know that what God, that God is going to work it out for our good. It may be hard right now. It may not have any good that we can find in it at the moment, but we, we're trusting a greater power. We're trusting his wisdom, and we're trusting in his strength, and we're trusting in his timing and his will for us to work this out for our good. Now we come to that part where it says, do not quench the spirit. What does that mean? Well, the word that is being used here uh, literally means to extinguish. And when you think of the word extinguish, uh, I think of the word fire. And what he's saying here, don't put out the fire. Don't put out the fire. See, God has been using this perhaps this time in, your, in my life and how to, uh, uh, he's used it to, to burn away, if you will, some of the things in my life, perhaps in your life, uh, and all that, that needed to be done away with a long time ago. 
uh, and and he has been it's been a, a, a you know a lot of times when God puts us through these times of pruning or or or, or testing uh, he is he is just removing the parts of our life that that have been blocking the way for other things that are needed in our life it, to get rid of this so he can make room for this and and so we don't need to we don't want to put that fire out during this time we hopefully we've learned not to quench the spirit not to fight God in all of this. But to trust God to to take take us through this and, and to remove from our lives things that He needed to by way of fire. Job speaks of this, doesn't he? He says, "When I come out of this fiery trial, I'll come out as gold." And uh, he knew that in the end, he's going to be better for what he was suffering and what he was having to endure at this particular time. And, and you and I hopefully have enough faith and enough trust in our God that we will embrace the fire rather than trying to reject it or, or put it out. That's one way in which we can we, we can quench the spirit that we don't want to. I like what Peter says. It's in 1 Peter chapter 4 and in verse 12. He said, dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials that you are going through as if something strange were happening to you. Instead, be very glad for these trials, for they will make you partners with Christ in his suffering, so that you will have the wonderful joy of seeing his glory when it is revealed to all of the world. You know, God uh, does things in our lives for us uh, in order that he can do great things through us. And, uh, and part of that is the fiery trials that he either allows to come into our lives or he even leads us into so that it makes us a better person uh, having experienced all of this. And now God has been trying to do a work in you. I believe in this time of darkness, he's been trying to do a work in you in preparation for a work he desires to do through you. That's something to get excited about. Maybe this hasn't been exciting, but I believe what's ahead can be. And, and we need to let God finish the work that he has set out to do in our lives so that we can be ready for the opportunities and all that we have that await us beyond what we have seen as un, uh, and as uh, perceived as an obstacle for our lives. So that's the second thing that we have we can have learned hopefully. Uh, first of all, that quiet time with God is a necessity, and, and secondly, to quench not the spirit. And, and the third thing is that quitting is not an option. Quitting is not an option. Uh, sometimes in our, our difficult times, our dark times, uh, like Elijah, we get worn out uh, and, and we, we feel like, you know, we, we just can't go on. And uh, that we don't want to go on. We just want to give up and, and we want to quit. I, I have read nowhere in, in, the, in the Bible when it comes to the regard to what God is doing in his children's lives, where, where the scripture tells us that quitting is an option. And uh, God wants us to not be quitters, but he wants us to be overcomers. He wants us to, to work through and uh, to hang in there and to work through because we are winners. And uh, as Paul said in, in his uh, letter to the Romans in the eighth chapter, we are, we are more than conquerors through Christ who loved us and, and who gave his life for us. Uh, and then when he writes to the Corinthians, he says this in, uh, in Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians, it is chapter 4, verse 6. Uh, this is a paraphrase. He says, we are persecuted but not abandoned. Yes, we're knocked down, but not destroyed. And, uh, and then it's uh, because God continues to pick us up and, and to enable us to, to move forward and beyond. I like what it says also in Proverbs in chapter 24 and verse 16. And this is the amplified version of this. It says, for a righteous man may fall seven times, but he rises up again and again. I think God eventually wants us to stay on our feet, but I think no matter how many times this world knocks us down, God wants us to get up and to keep going, to not give up because we will prevail, and I'll, even as he has prevailed. Galatians chapter 6, verse 9 says this, so let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. You know, giving up is not an option for us as Christians. I hope to see you back in church when we have the opportunity. I hope to work with you, to worship with you, and to witness alongside of you. 
And I, I hope this is going to bring us closer to each other as, as it will closer to our God. And, and, and it'll and encourage us. Those of us who have been on the side will now be in the midst. And we will be ready to give God our all uh, and to serve him in ways that we haven't in maybe in some time or in greater ways than what we have up until this particular time. I refuse to be a statistic of this quarantine. And I refuse to be one of those who was taken down and as a result of what they have had to go through, remain down. But get up and let us get going again. Let us serve the Lord. I hope we've learned that quitting is not an option. Remember this, my brothers and sisters, God created you. You're not an accident. You're not a mistake. And you're not a statistic. You are someone unique and special, and God has a purpose for your life as much as he does mine or anyone else's, and God wants you to understand that. He wants you to pursue that and allow him to work in you and through you to see that become, uh, become a reality. Remember what Paul said when he wrote to the Philippians in chapter 1? And this is our confidence that he who has begun a good work in you will carry it unto completion. God's not given up. And now God will not let up until he has accomplished all that he wants to accomplish in and through your life and mine as well. We need to put our trust in Jesus Christ in light of all of this. Lord, and, and trust and, and, and pray to him, Lord, and now you have been with me. You have been faithful. It's made my heart understand the importance that I be faithful as well in response to you. And now that I give you my all because you've given me your all. You have not shortchanged me in this time of difficulty. And now for everything that's been taken from me, you have added to my life because of your presence, because of your love for me. If you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, I hope and pray that you will turn your life over to the Lord today. And now that you will trust him. And now you will find that the next time you go through a, a dark time or a difficult time, next time you must attend another school, if you will, uh, it may not be called coronavirus, it may be something else, but you're going to be better prepared for it because you have allowed Jesus Christ to be uh, in your heart. And you've allowed him not only to be your savior and, and forgiving you of your sins and, and redeeming you from your sin, but also your Lord. And of the one who is able to lead you because he has all wisdom and he has the power not only to tell you the way in which your life should go, but to take you through that, uh, through that journey so that you are successful in doing so. I believe if you will make a, make a prayer along those lines, be it a, as a Christian or as one who today wishes to become a Christian, that God will hear such a prayer and he will answer it. And, we, and you know what? We're going to come through this school with flying colors. We're going to have passing grades uh, when we allow Jesus Christ to have his will in us and through us. Amen? I believe so. Amen. Let us pray. Father, I want to thank you for your precious word. Your prophet, your prophet Elijah, had been through some uh, tough times. And he, he, he was ready to accept failure, but you wouldn't let him. He was ready to, to, to give up, but he wouldn't allow it. And uh, he, he was ready to, to uh, think that, uh, that it is not really, it's not really uh, something that, that, uh, that pays, that is, to, to, to serve you. And, and because nobody seems to care. Nobody seems to, uh, to appreciate it. And, but, Lord, that's not really true. That's, the, that's what the enemy wants us to believe. Help us to listen to you. Get us alone in those quiet times so you can speak to our hearts and, and help us to be able to hear your still small voice. And uh, help us, Lord, to quench not the spirit, to allow you to do what you have to do in us so that you can then do what you want to do through us. And make us realize again that quitting is never an option. And uh, this, is a, this, this has been a test, but it wasn't a test to, to fail us. It was a test in all to enable us and not to be to be uh, uh, to go forth and live victoriously as we should and we can uh, and we must we'll give you the glory and the praise through jesus christ our lord amen